Buckle up, because today we are diving into the world of vampires. Vampires. But not the vampires you might be thinking of. Right. Not the sparkly ones. Yeah, we're going way beyond the typical charming counts and teenage heartthrobs you see in movies and books these days. You think you know vampires, but you have no idea. Exactly. We're going deep with this one. Deep dive. Yes, a deep dive. We've got excerpts from some seriously fascinating texts about vampire folklore. Ancient stuff. Oh, yeah. Super old. And let me tell you, these texts are packed with details that completely changed how I see these creatures of the night. You're going to be surprised by just how old the idea of vampires really is. It's crazy, right? To think that humans have been telling stories about these creatures for centuries, even millennia. Yeah, millennia. It's mind-blowing. So where do we even begin with something this ancient? I mean, we're talking way before Dracula and all that. Well, we can start by going way back to ancient Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Okay, so we're talking like really old. Right. Like ancient civilization old. Exactly. They had these beings called Lilitu. Lilitu. What were those? Some kind of Mesopotamian monster? You could say that. They were said to prey on people, especially children. That's creepy. And what did they do? Often they were described as consuming their blood. Blood. Okay, so we're already getting into vampire territory here. But mm -hmm. why blood? What was it about blood that made these cultures connect it to creatures like the Lulitu? That's a great question. And it's something you see across a lot of different cultures. This idea that blood represents life essence. Life essence. So like the very core of what makes us alive. Exactly. So by consuming someone's blood, a creature like a Lulitu wasn't just being monstrous. It was thought to be stealing that person's very life force. Oh, that's a chilling thought. And this idea wasn't unique to Mesopotamia, right? Right, at all. The ancient Greeks had their own versions of these creatures. Like who? Well, there was the Lamia, often depicted as these alluring women who would lure men to their deaths. Okay, so kind of like sirens, but with a taste for blood. Exactly. And then there were the Empusae, these terrifying female demons. They were often described as having one bronze foot and one donkey's hoof. Wait a minute, a bronze foot and a donkey hoof. Now that's a visual I wasn't expecting. Yeah, it's a strange one, right? But that's kind of the point. These cultures use these really vivid and often bizarre descriptions to emphasize how otherworldly and unsettling these beings were. They were something beyond human comprehension. So they were tapping into those primal fears, the things that go bump in the night. Exactly. And those anxieties weren't confined to Mesopotamia or Greece. We see evidence of similar beliefs in ancient Hebrew texts as well. So this wasn't just a Greek or Mesopotamian thing. It was more widespread. Much more. You see these vampire-like creatures popping up in cultures all over the world, which really makes you think about why these stories have resonated with humans for so long. It's like this primal fear of something coming back from the dead and stealing our life force. It's the stuff of nightmares. And it's a fear that clearly transcended cultural boundaries. So tell me more about those Hebrew texts. What kind of creatures did they describe? Well, there's this really interesting account from the 16th century. 16th century. So we're talking hundreds of years after these ancient civilizations. Right. This was written by a prominent rabbi named David Ben Solomon Ibn Abi Zimra. Okay. And what did he say? He wrote about this older woman who, after she died, people started to believe that she was coming back and causing harm. Hold on. This rabbi from the 1500s was writing about something that sounds a lot like our modern day vampire. It does, doesn't it? And it shows just how persistent these beliefs were even centuries after those ancient civilizations had faded. So what did they think was going on? Why did they think this woman had come back? Well, Rabbi Zimra linked it to improper burial rites. The belief was that if a body wasn't treated properly in death, it left it vulnerable to evil spirits. Interesting. So even back then, they were looking for explanations for these events. They might not have had the scientific understanding we have today, but they were trying to make sense of the world around them. Exactly. And it highlights how intertwined these beliefs were with deeply held cultural and religious practices. That makes sense. I mean, death and what happens afterward has always been one of humanity's biggest mysteries. Absolutely. And these vampire myths were one way of trying to grapple with that mystery. It's fascinating how these ancient cultures, separated by time and geography, all grappled with similar fears and anxieties expressing them through these bloodthirsty creatures. But how do we get from these ancient myths to the vampires we know today? The ones with the fangs and the capes and the aversion to garlic. That's what I want to know. Well, that's where things get really interesting. So we've been talking about ancient cultures and their vampire myths, and it just all seems so distant. But it was very real to these 
these people. Oh, absolutely. These were beliefs that shaped their entire worldview. And I think that's what's so fascinating about this whole topic. It's like a window into how people thought and what they feared. Exactly. But somewhere along the line, these kind of scattered myths, they solidify into something much more specific, right? Right. And that takes us to Eastern Europe. Okay, Eastern Europe. So we're moving ahead in time a bit now. Yes, yeah, specifically to the 17th and 18th centuries. 17th and 18th centuries. So we're talking about the era of powdered wigs and horse-drawn carriages. Exactly. Mm -hmm. This is where we start to see a lot of the traits we now associate with vampires really crystallize. Like what, what kind of traits are we talking about? Well, this is when you start to see those more concrete descriptions emerge. The yeah. pale skin. Oh, okay. The fangs. Okay. Getting closer to the vampires we recognize. The aversion to sunlight. Right, like the classic vampire weaknesses. But this was more than just stories, right? You mentioned something about documented events. Yeah, this is the really interesting part. It's not just folklore anymore. During this period, there was this real fear that the dead were rising from their graves to harm the living. Okay. Now, this is where things start to feel really eerie. So, what do you mean by documented events? Like... Official records of vampire sightings. Not sightings exactly, but reports of attacks, or rather what people believed were vampire attacks. So people were really attributing deaths and illnesses to vampires. They were looking for explanations, and vampires provided a convenient scapegoat. So it's like a combination of superstition and a lack of scientific understanding. Exactly. They couldn't see the germs, yeah. the bacteria that we understand today. So they attributed these misfortunes to something more sinister, something supernatural. Yeah. And this fear, this belief in vampires, it wasn't just contained to small villages, right? This was a widespread panic. It was huge. We have documented cases from this period, like the one involving a man named Peter Blagojevich. Peter Blagojevich. Okay, I've never heard of him. He became pretty infamous in this whole vampire panic. Officials were brought in to investigate claims that he had risen from the dead and was attacking people. Wow. So this wasn't just whispers and rumors. This fear went all the way to the authorities. Well, yeah, it was serious business. And the authorities, they took these claims very seriously. What did they do? Well, in Peter's case, they actually exhumed his body. They dug him up. Why? What were they looking for? They were looking for proof of vampirism. And what did they consider proof? They claimed his body showed no signs of decomposition, which to them was a clear sign of vampirism. Hold on. No decomposition, but we talked about how ancient cultures misinterpreted natural processes after death. Was that happening here too? It's very possible. Decomposition rates can vary widely depending on factors like temperature and burial conditions. So it might have just been a matter of circumstance. I exactly. Mm. But without that scientific understanding, people saw what they feared. And what they feared was vampires. Precisely. They saw a fresh corpse and attributed it to the supernatural. And that fear, it drove them to take some drastic measures. So they dug up this guy, Peter, looking for proof of vampirism. And they thought they found it because his body wasn't decomposing at the rate they expected. Which, as we were saying, could have been due to any number of natural factors. Exactly. But they didn't have that knowledge back then. So what did they do? I mean, they went to all this trouble to exhume him. They must have done something. Oh, yeah. They weren't just going to leave him be. So what did they do? They staked his body. Staked him? You mean like with a wooden stake through the heart? That's the one. And then they reburied him. Wow. It's incredible how real this all was for them. It really is. It shows just how deep-seated those beliefs were. It's like something out of a horror movie, but it was their reality. And it wasn't just P.I. There were other cases like this happening all over Eastern Europe. People were terrified. I can imagine. So what did they do? How did they protect themselves from these supposed vampires? I mean, were we at garlic and crucifixes yet? Some of those elements start to appear during this period, but we're really talking about a whole range of practices here, many of them tied to local folklore and tradition. For example, some people believe that vampires couldn't cross running water. Really? So they would try to live near rivers or on islands? Exactly. They thought it would offer them some protection. And it wasn't just water. They used all sorts of things to create barriers, yeah. physical and supernatural. Like what? Give me some examples. Well, we do see the use of crucifixes and holy water. But then you have things like placing thorny branches or nets around graves. Thorny branches? What was the thinking there? The idea was to trap the vampire in its grave to prevent it from rising. Interesting. It's like they were using whatever they could find to ward off evil. Exactly. And some of these practices might have even had some basis in reality. What do you mean? Well, think about it. Placing thorny branches around a grave, it might have also deterred grave robbers or animals. Ah, uh, that makes sense. 
So even though they attributed these practices to supernatural beliefs, there might have been some practical considerations as well. Right. It's like a blend of folklore and pragmatism. That's fascinating. But then you have those other practices that are a bit harder to explain. Like what about that one with the virgin boy on a stallion? Oh, yeah, that's a classic. The belief was that the stallion being cure would be drawn to a vampire's grave or refuse to approach it, which would reveal the vampire's resting place. So the horse was like a living vampire detector. You could say that. It's amazing how those beliefs often incorporated themes of purity and innocence, like they were seen as weapons against the forces of darkness. Absolutely. The virgin boy, the untouched stallion, they represented a kind of untainted life force, a stark contrast to the vampire state of undeath. Which is a pretty powerful image when you think about it. It is. Yeah. And it shows just how deeply ingrained these beliefs were in the culture. But even with all these protections, the fear persisted. Huh. When did this start to change? When did we start to see vampires move away from these terrifying figures of folklore? Well, as we move into the 18th century, enlightenment thinking starts to take hold. And with it comes a greater emphasis on reason and scientific inquiry. So people are starting to question these old superstitions. Exactly. They're looking for more rational explanations for the world around them. And the vampire, well, it starts to lose its grip on the collective imagination. But it doesn't disappear completely. Not at all. It just takes on a new form, a new kind of life. And that's where we see the emergence of the literary vampire. Exactly. The vampire transforms from a creature of nightmares into a captivating figure of fiction. And that's a whole other story. It is fascinating how that happens, though, how something so terrifying can become such a source of entertainment. Well, I think it speaks to the enduring power of these myths. Even when we stop believing in them, literally, they still have this hold on us. They tap into something primal, something deep within the human psyche. Exactly. Our fears, our desires, our fascination with the unknown. And that's why even today, centuries after those ancient myths first emerged, we're still drawn to these creatures of the night. Still trying to uncover the secrets of the vampire. Still captivated by the darkness. That's all the time we have for today's deep dive, but I have a feeling this isn't the last we'll be hearing from these creatures of the night. Oh, there are many more secrets to uncover. Many more stories to tell. Until next time, keep exploring, keep asking questions, and keep diving deep into the mysteries that surround us.